there's hope yet, huh? <laughs> Page number 155. Wonderful grace of Jesus. Page number 155 this morning. Page number 155. Page number 155. Wonderful grace of Jesus, greater than all our sin. How shall I come this Number 352 this morning, as you're turning to number 352, let's take care of some announcements this morning and birthdays and anniversaries. Our Bible reading this morning will be in Romans chapter 10 this morning, so you can think about that here in just a little while. Birthdays on the 11th, that is in a few days. So Richard Day has a birthday on the 11th. Also on the 12th, we have Chris Dodge. And remember, uh, has a birthday on that day, and that's the only birthdays that we have on our list for this week. It's short and sweet, right? So let's sing to these folks today. Happy birthday to you, Jesus be true, God bless you and keep you the whole year through. Tomorrow, Shay and Whitney Gilbert has an anniversary. Are they here this morning? Okay, and then on the 10th, Elijah and Hannah Wilson has an anniversary also. And so let's sing anniversary songs to them this morning, all right? Happy anniversary to you, to Jesus be true. God bless you and keep you the whole year through. All right, 
baby shower for Noel and Alan Edward, six o'clock this Thursday night here at church. Baby shower here at six o'clock for Noel and Alan Edward at six o'clock here at the church. And that's this coming Thursday, all right? All right, let's turn to page number 352 this morning. Look and live. Page number 352. I've a message from the Lord, hallelujah. A message unto you, my dear. came from in the Bible. Numbers 21. What was that all about? In numbers, right? In numbers, they had to look to this, you know, to the cross, and we have to look to the cross too. And that serpent there that was on that cross that day. All right. Page number 391 this morning. Page number 391. <clears throat> I am resolved that we're going to stand on the fourth verse, so get ready, all right? Okay. Page number 391. I am resolved no longer to linger, charmed by the world's evil eye. Things that are higher, things that are lower, these have allured my side. I will hasten to bring faces to land and free. with someone today and then welcome folks to church and be a blessing to one another today.
That's good piano music. I don't care. I like that. Amen. Brother Dan's going to come and lead us in our scripture reading. I made a, a mistake there. Romans chapter 9 this morning. Romans, not Romans 10, but chapter 9 of Romans this morning. Good to have all you visitors with us today. May have to get the gavel out. I don't know. All right, our scripture reading this morning is Romans chapter 9. Would you stand, please? When you find your place there, we'll read it responsively through Romans chapter 9. I say the truth in Christ, I lie not, my conscience also bearing me witness in the Holy Ghost. For I could wish that myself were accursed from Christ for my brethren, my kinsmen according to the flesh. Whose are the fathers, and of whom concerning the flesh Christ came, who is over all, God blessed forever. Amen. <clears throat> Neither because they are the seed of Abraham are they all children, but in Isaac shall thy seed be called. For this is the word of promise. At this time I will come, and Sarah shall have a son. For the children being not yet born, neither having done any good or evil, that the purpose of God according to election might stand, not of works, but of him that it calleth. As it is written, Jacob have I loved, but Esau have I hated. For he saith to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. For the scripture saith unto Pharaoh, Even for this same purpose have I raised thee up, that I might show my power in thee, and that my name might be declared throughout all the earth. Thou wilt say then unto me, Why doth God, why doth he yet find fault? Or who hath resisted his will? Hath not the potter power over the clay of the same lump to make one vessel unto honor and another unto dishonor? And that he might make known the riches of his glory on the vessels of mercy, which he hath afore prepared unto glory. As he saith also in Osi, I will call them my people, which were not my people, and her beloved, which was not beloved. Isaiah also crieth concerning Israel, though the number of the children of Israel be as the sand of the sea, a remnant shall be saved. And as Isaiah said before, except the Lord of Sabaoth hath left us a seed, we had been as Sodom and made like unto Gomorrah. But Israel, which followed after the law of righteousness, hath not attained to the law of righteousness. As it is written, Behold, I lay in Zion a stumbling stone and a rock of offense, and whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. Thank you. You may be seated. Brethren, we have met to worship and adore the Lord our God. Will you
just take care of a few announcements here today. First of all, Carter, thank you. So we'd like to thank each and every one that took part in making Caleb and Rosanna's wedding day so special. It was a tremendous blessing to see all the love and hard work that was poured out for them. God bless you all, Jim and Kelly McFadden. And it was a beautiful wedding and a wonderful service, I thought, for the Lord's sake. And uh, just happy for them. Also, this Saturday will be Taylor and Susanna's wedding. And, uh, and uh, just a lot going on. Amen. And we're glad for all that. And in the meantime, there's a lot of socializing at the back of this church. If you're interested, just go back here. You'll meet your future wife or husband somewhere back there, possibly. This is the folder on the revival meeting coming up over at the tent revival. It starts the 14th over at Ava at the city park. This Wednesday night, we're having a canvassing and a visitation trying to cover the entire city of Ava. Michael, flag your hand. Uh, we have, uh, we're trying to get 19 separate teams that'll cover the city house to house. We're meeting at 530 at the city park pavilion. It's across from the swimming pool. And the good part is that our place uh, trailer will be there to feed everybody after you get back from visiting, not before. I told them don't feed anybody before. No, there and they'll be there. And the church is paying for your meal. So you bring your family. I don't care if you got 20 kids, you bring them and you visit it when it's done. Why we're going to have our place will be there to feed everybody afterward. Some people are coming just to pray and they're at the pavilion. And I'm so glad for that. But be in prayer for this tent meeting starts the 14th. That's a week from Monday night on that. Um, let me just say a couple of things I want to hit this morning. I think it'd be a help to people. Uh, you know, the devil's always trying to do something stupid. Amen. Yeah. But if you're on Facebook, which you know, if you are, whatever, I, I'm, I'm on Facebook for one reason. That's try to get the gospel out. And that's honest truth. It wasn't for that. I, just, I really don't care for it. But uh, when, when somebody puts a prayer request on there, if people don't hit like or comment, that doesn't mean they didn't pray. Yeah. Don't let the devil tell you, well, nobody, nobody, nobody commented. Nobody said they're going to pray. That's nonsense. Don't be that childish. Yeah. Please. Amen. You know, if, if I waited till everybody said like, I, I, I'd have quit years ago. <laughs> All right. You, you just, you know, you put it out there if you want to. But just because people don't hit like or because they don't comment does, does not mean they didn't pray or anything. And also, I just want to give you a thought here about our home life, our church life and with people and wherever you're at. Uh, you know, we have duty, but duty, ought to be, there ought to be more duty in life than duty. It could, should be a delight. And uh, try to make your home a delight, your marriage a delight. And um, let's make church a delight for people. Amen. Amen. And uh, anyway, this morning we have with us, uh, real quick this morning, the stall, stall, uh, folks back here, Matt and Kathy. And Stallman, is that right? Come on up here real quick, Brother Stallman. And they're missionaries to Europe and over in the, in the East, Middle East. And I've asked him just to take three to five minutes here to introduce their work to you and just tell you about what they're doing. And you just jump, jump and go. All right. Thank you, Brother. I appreciate that. Well, you all probably do not remember me, but in 2001, uh, Brother Van reached out to me. I went to Camp Joy. We had been in Africa. My wife and I surrendered to Africa in 1999, and we started in Malawi. Got over there, started two churches, spent just about every day sick. We had problems with security and were robbed on a lot of occasions. We had a lot of stuff that uh, we struggled with there for that time of ministry. And in 01, we came back for a little bit of a furlough to rest. And Brother Van reached out. I preached at Camp Joy there with Brother Gil Massingill in 01. So it's been, that's the last time I was through here. And so when we came back uh, uh, from Africa, we didn't go back after that. We were sort of lost. Have you ever tried something and failed miserably? That's what Africa was for us. You talk about a corner wheat going in the ground to die. In John chapter number 12, that ministry in every way to me felt at, like it was a failure. The Lord knew what he was doing. Both the churches we established are still functioning. They're still gospel preaching. I hear from both the pastors still after 20 years. But for our family, it was, uh, it was extremely difficult. So we came back in 01 and we didn't know how to reset. We couldn't get our kids over the malaria. Uh, we were struggling in just about every way. And so 01 to 06 was a time of life where we just, we kind of went to, we drug ourselves back to church. We were still trying to be faithful to the Lord. But I felt like we had gone and we had tried and we had failed. And then, so what is next? And, uh, you know, trying to think about a career change and how to get settled back into ministry. And 06, I met a man, he came through and he preached a sermon on why missionaries fail. 
And while he's preaching that sermon, my wife and I are looking at each other. We're keeping notes. And we're like, yes, yes, yes. And, and we were nine out of ten. Ten reasons he gave missionaries fail. We had checked off nine of them applied to us. All of the things that we did not know. And then so afterwards, another missionary, a veteran missionary, said to me, he said, didn't anybody tell you about all those things? We said, no. No, they gave us a hundred bucks, patted us on the back, said they'll pray. And we went to Africa and we got whipped there. And so after four or five years out of the ministry, God put a ministry in our heart. And in 07, we started training, recruiting and training missionaries for the mission field. So from 07 up until this year, we've spent our lives, dedicated our lives to preparing young people, high school students, college students, young missionaries as they go. And we have worked probably in 35 countries all over South America, Asia and into Africa, getting missionaries there, getting them established and helping them through the hardships that we endured. So just this last year, we have shifted our focus into Europe a little bit because we found that Europe is one of the least reached places with the gospel of Jesus Christ. And that sounds strange to me because I'm an Africa guy, you know, I, I love Africa. But I looked at the numbers and, and numerically, there are more born again Christians in Nigeria. There are more born again Christians in India, more in China than there are in Europe. Less than 2% of people in Europe even claim to be born again. Doesn't mean they are. It means 98% won't even give a testimony to say that they're born again. And so God's really directed our hearts towards uh, places like France, places like Greece, North Macedonia, Albania, Bulgaria. And so again, we're recruiting, training missionaries and ministering to the guys on the field there. And we're working with Macedonia World Baptist Missions. We're independent Baptists, but God has been really good to us over these last years to allow us to encourage these missionaries. I get to preach the gospel. I love to preach the gospel. But our heart is getting the guys recruited, trained, and placed on the mission field. So, Pastor, thank you for letting me speak here, and it's good to be back. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> I like what I just heard. Amen. And uh, Brother Stallman, stay in touch with us. Would you do that? Stay in touch with us. I'd like to visit with you more about it. We're sending out our first foreign missionary this year. Folks sitting over here going to Mexico. And... Um, Anyway, very, I'll tell you what, uh, that even goes along with my message today. I sat there and thought about that, what the purposes God had in, quote, that failure and uh, how, how he used that. Take your Bibles this morning to Job chapter 12. We're going to look at several scriptures to start with. Job chapter 12, and, um, and then we're going to go to Matthew chapter 13, verses 45 and 46. Job chapter 12, verse number 7, 8, and 9. Job chapter 12, verse 7, 8, 9. I'm just going to read it off the board if they've got that possibly up there. Maybe, does anybody tell me where Job is at? Where's Job? Anybody know where Job's at? Oh, there it is. There's Job up there. Okay. I want you to look at this verse of scripture that God just puts in the Bible. It's a wonderful thing. He said, now ask the beast. Well, we walk up to a squirrel and start talking to a squirrel. God wants you to talk to animals. <laughs> now, <laughs> ask the beast and they shall do what? What do they do? Beasts can teach you things. You, if you study a 10-point buck, boys, you will find out how to not get shot. Don't chase girls. <laughs> anyway, whatever. Ask the beast. They shall teach thee in the fowl. He said, not just the beast, but he said, look at the birds. They're going to teach you things. And they shall tell thee, or speak to the earth, and it shall teach thee. God says, look around you. Look at what's going on in the earth. And the fishes of the sea. Hmm. And the, the, they're going to declare something unto you. They're going to declare things to you. God says, I have put these animals. In fact, the next verse, look what it says. Who knoweth not in all these that the hand of the Lord hath wrought this? I, I, I'm not preaching on giraffes today, but you want to do a wild study, study giraffe. If you want to know an animal that just kills an evolution, is study a giraffe. It's unreal. What has to happen in a giraffe's neck, head, and chest in order for him just to drink water and then raise his head up? What they've discovered, I mean, it's unbelievable. There's no way in the world that, that dude could have evolved. I mean, that had to be special creation, amen. Amen. So now I want you to go to the Bible in, in the Matthew chapter 13, verses 45 and 46. And while you're turning there, I want you to see what I got. Now, I'll tell you what, I got to be careful with these. 
How many knows what these are? These are pearls. These are pearls. I've been preaching 41 years, Brother Jerry, and I've never preached on pearls, and yet they're in the Bible. And somebody says, well, that's not an animal, but it came from an animal. And I tell you what, I've been into something this week that blowed my mind. I mean, my mind's been blowed. That's why you won't make much sense of my message. My mind doesn't been blowed out. But I want to preach today on this subject right here about pearls. I want to preach specifically on why. Let me ask you. I don't want to embarrass you. Sister uh, Susanna, are you going to have pearls at your wedding? You are. I'm glad to find out. You don't have to have pearls at your wedding. But a lot of weddings have the bride wears pearls. These are Karen's pearls. And I, I, I was pretty sure she had some. And she comes dragging this sack out and said, here they are. And I said, boy, you would trust me to take them things to church. I'm going to go to a pawn shop on the way out of here. <laughs> but these are Karen's pearls right here. And pearls, and I want to preach a message on why do brides have pearls as part of their attire in their wedding ceremony and who started that and why'd they start it in American culture right now a lot of things are changing whereas used to weddings and funerals and a lot of things in our culture always fed out of scriptural biblical truth that was embedded within the culture of our nation you're losing a lot of that now and especially at a wedding, there's all kinds of reasons, and I ought to do this some Sunday, there's just probably 25 to 30 biblical principles that is in a wedding ceremony that we don't even think about or recognize. But I want to preach on the subject of why pearls are part of the brides, and honey, I'm going to give these back, well, I'll just wait, all right, stop at that pawn shop on the way home. Anyway, Matthew chapter 13, let's look at that, and let's look at this passage of scripture here. Again, the kingdom of heaven is likened to a merchant man seeking goodly what? Pearls. pearls. Now watch this, watch this. Who, when he had found one pearl of great price, went and sold all that he had. He sold everything he had when he found this one pearl of great price and he bought it. Huh. One pearl of great price, and he bought it. Now, a parable we were talking this morning in church is an earthly illustration of natural phenomena, or of a natural phenomenon that reveals a spiritual truth. What can we learn from these pearls I've got in my pocket that God made? There, it came from an animal. A parable uses the natural to reveal the spiritual. A parable uses the earthly to reveal a heavenly. A parable specifically uh, reveals from what can be seen to what cannot be seen. Jesus used parables continuously. He talked about soil and seed and meal and tares and wheat and sheep and birds and hens and thorns. And it's just the Bible's full of all these natural phenomena that he used to teach. Now I want to tell you something. Jesus was a common man's preacher. The common men heard him gladly, your Bible says. You ought to pay attention to that. When somebody gets too high in theological, somebody gets off on all this Hebrew, Greek, blah, 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 and they're trying to tell you that they're a spiritual giraffe. You know what B.R. Lakin said? He said, you preacher boys, he said, you keep that feed down low where the sheep can get it. He said, let them giraffe bend their necks. They want anything, make them bend their necks to get it. Said, you keep it down there where anybody can, you keep it where a child can understand what's being preached. There's a lot of truth to that. His messages were simple, yet they were profound. And uh, this week we've had a wedding yesterday. We're going to have a wedding next week. And I don't know, I guess my mind got spun out on these weddings, you know, and just you know, whatever. And then I, uh, I, I wouldn't get into that, but... Uh, often, as I said, pearls are present at a wedding. They're used, sometimes they're given, they're received at a wedding for the bride to wear. Oftentimes you'll see a grandmother or a mother give her daughter the pearls to wear at a, at a, a wedding. But why in the world do young ladies wear pearls at a wedding? What did our forebears, our forefathers, Christian forefathers, why did they ever do that? Well, who ever come up with that? Just, oh, they're pretty? Why didn't they put silver or gold or rubies? Why pearls? There's a reason, and there's a biblical reason he did that. Because pearls are involved 
in the description and the revealing and the identification of the bride of Christ. And the bride, when she comes into that service, is a picture of the bride of Christ. And if you don't believe that, you don't believe Ephesians chapter 5. Because Jesus, our Lord, uh, the Bible said, and I speak concerning Christ and the church. When God put a marriage together, he put a picture together of Jesus Christ as the groom and the, and the church as the bride. And what this pearl up here is, is a picture of the church. And how the church came into being, is a, the pearls are a picture of that. It is no accident that the Holy Ghost uses pearls in describing the kingdom of heaven. Pearls uh, are called the queen of jewels. It is the only gem style, gemstone in the world that comes from a living creature. Natural pearls are very, very rare. Now, I'll tell you something. I'm just going to be honest with you. I don't know how this is going to go. I've got about 16 rabbit trails I could run. I had to just quit and come to church. I mean, there's, a, I mean, literally some stuff. I mean, you can't believe what all is in this deal about pearls. It blew me away. But a natural pearl is opposed to what's called cultural pearls. We may get to that today. Less than one in 10,000 wild oysters contain pearls. The most expensive pearl known in, in the world is valued at $100 million. It was discovered off the coast of the Philippines. It's 26, 26 inches long, weighs 75 pounds. Largest pearl known to exist. The estimated value is $100 million. And I think that was just found not too many years ago, 10 or 12 years ago. In ancient Rome, Julius Caesar created a law about pearls that no common man could wear them. He said they're only reserved for those of wealth, prestige, and especially authority. Pearls come in many various colors and shapes in all kinds of cultures across the globe. But historically, pearls have symbolized purity, clarity, loyalty, value, and longevity. The oyster shell that a pearl comes out of uh, has an exoskeleton. It has three different layers in it. I kind of thought that was interesting to have three layers to an oyster. He has the outer, and I'm not going to try to pronounce that word, proteinicon, whatever you call that, whatever that is. He has the middle layer called prismatic, and then he has his innermost layer, and that's what's called the NACRE, and I would even write that, oh, there, there you go, and uh, the knacker layer. And uh, that knacker layer is where you get your mother of pearl at, where you, a lot of times buttons are made out of. What do they make out of mother of pearl? Just different articles and things like that, right? But there's a, this third layer in the pearl is called the mother of pearl. Now think about that, mother of pearl. Hmm. And it produces inside the shell, this is the pearl layer because uh, it has an iridescent light with reflective qualities. This is what that necker produces. The necker layer, N-A-C-R-E, is called the mother of pearl. Now, before we get going on this, I want to clear up some false and untrue interpretations and applications of the scripture that we just read. In this parable of the pearl, the great pearl, price, the pearl of great price, there are theologians who say that the merchant man is the lost sinner who is seeking the great pearl of salvation. That's not true. That's a wrong interpretation of that scripture. There's two problems that I know of with it to start with. And that is in Romans chapter 3 verse 11, the Bible said, The Holy Ghost of God said by the word of God, There's none that seeketh after God. There's none that doeth good, no, not one. It is God that seeks the lost man, not the lost man seeking God. Lost people rebel and run from God. Now it is true that God can draw the sinner to himself. But without God's drawing and God's power at work in that lost man's life, he will run from God and rebel against God every time. Amen. Second of all, salvation cannot be bought by the lost sinner. Amen. The merchant man here is buying something. You cannot buy your salvation. So that interpretation of that is wrong. Absolutely. Ephesians 2 says, For by grace are you saved, and that through, uh, by, uh, through faith, that not of yourselves is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. I spent an hour with a man this week sitting at a table with him, trying to make him understand grace, to make him understand that salvation was a gift. 
And I'm telling you, when that gets, when it, when that gets embedded in people's mind that somehow or another, you've got to do things to earn salvation. We've got people here today that's going to be baptized right after service. And you don't want to miss this baptism today, I'll tell you. And, uh, but, you know, uh, they're, getting, they're getting baptized because they're saved, not to be saved. Right. Amen? Their baptism is not saving them. Their works of righteousness does not save them that. So what is this pearl of great price? It is the church. Put up Acts 20, 28, if you will. Acts 20, 28. And I'm going to try to be calm and sweet and nice and methodical and not get out of the banks and climb over the top of the pews today, okay? Because you might want to watch out, all righty? Now I'm going to say something. And having said that, churches need to balance. Everything needs to be done decently and in order, right? But I tell you, it won't hurt you to have an old glorified hallelujah shout spell every once in a while either. Some of you quit need to go into a shrink and just shout it out. Amen. I'll tell you, you don't need a psychologist. You need Jesus. Amen. Now, I'm telling you that right now. I'll get fired up here. Bible says this here. Take heed therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock over which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseer. Did you know the churches vote preachers in? That ain't what the Bible says. The Holy Ghost is the one who makes the overseer of the flock. Amen. And he said to feed the church of God. And that tell you what that's in my heart. And God put that in my heart to feed the church of God. Watch what he said. Which he hath purchased with what? God purchased with his own blood. I'll tell you, there's nothing more priceless and precious than the blood of Christ that purchased the church of God. And the parable of the sower is the merchant man. He's going after the pearl of great price and he sees it so all heaven had and came and bought the pearl of great price, the church of our Lord Jesus Christ. Let me just tell you something. When you've given your blood, when you've given your life, you give it all. Amen. There's nothing more you can give when you've given your life and you've given your blood. And there is no more precious, priceless blood than the Lord Jesus Christ. Take care. Uh, go to 1 Peter chapter 1, verse number 18 and verse number 19. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse number uh, uh, 18 and 19. He what are you trying to prove? I'm trying to prove to you from the Bible that the church is the pearl of great price. The Bible said here, for as much as you know, that you were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold from your vain conversation received by tradition from your fathers, but with what? The precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. And the Bible tells us there that the church is purchased by the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm telling you something right now. Only jewel, the, the pearl is the only jewel formed from something living. Uh, diamonds, rubies, gold, silver, all of that comes from non-living uh, material. The, the pearl is the only gemstone in the world that comes from a living uh, uh, thing. Let me tell you how the church was formed. It was formed by a living Savior. Amen. I serve a living Savior. He's in the world today. Brother, I'll tell you something right now. I didn't come to worship dead Muhammad. I come to worship Jesus Christ who has risen from the dead. The Bible said, he said, I'm he that was dead. He said, I'm he that liveth. And I was dead. And behold, I'm alive. How long? Forever, he said. I want to tell you something right. You said, Reggie, how do you know that Jesus Christ is alive? He, the living Savior, formed something in me that's alive this morning. I didn't come to a church, dead, dead church service this morning. I'm not worshiping a dead God. I'm the, in fact, there's somebody living down inside. He created life. And he is the one who gives life. Now I'm going to give you some further proof of that. You say, Reggie, who can be out there? There's not, a, there's not a savior in the world, not a religious world, that can take a crook and make him honest. Amen. You want to know about, hey, Somebody got on Facebook talking about uh, that revival down there, Dave, and said, is there going to be signs and wonders and miracles there? Yeah, boy. Amen. Yes, sir. You want a sign? I'll give you one. He rose from the dead. Amen. If that sign won't fix you, that, watching somebody's leg grow won't make you believe either. Amen. Amen. You say, is there wonders going to be done? Yes, sir. It's a wonder he saved a sinner like me. Amen. You say, is there going to be signs? Yeah. I quit a lot of stuff. Amen. That's a pretty good sign. i tell you what. I love God anymore. Love his word. I love Jesus Christ. That's a pretty good sign. Something happened. But if you want to see somebody's toe get healed up, I'm going to tell you there ain't enough to make happen to make you. Okay, well, I get off of that. <laughs> that fires me up. Amen. amen. They want to see signs and wonders and miracles. Well, just get saved. Amen. amen. Obey your Bible. Amen. You'll see signs and wonders. Amen. I'm telling you right now, who can take a man who worships a syringe and has needle tracks all up and down his arm. And I tell him, put him in church. 
with a Bible in his lap, amen, and a song in his heart. And he don't want that needle no more. I tell you, you want to see somebody living that'll change you. The power of Christ is that he changes lives, amen. I'm going to tell you, if he hadn't changed you, you're not saved, amen. God will change you, amen. I'm telling you right now, any man being Christ, he's what? He's a new creature. God creates a new man inside. And not only that, but I tell you, who can take a woman? I tell you, what are you sitting at a bar with a bottle of beer in her hand? Bring her to church and save her. Amen. And put a Bible in her lap and a song in her heart. I'm telling you, only God can do that. That's what God can do. Amen. Ain't a shrink can do that. There's not a doctor can do that. There's not a politician can do that. I am telling you this morning, I'm preaching about a living Savior. And the pearl comes from a living creature. And our Savior is living. Now, first of all, I want to preach on the pearl and its sufferings. You say, Reggie, how's a pearl get made? It gets made through suffering. That's how it gets made. The pearls form through suffering. The oyster, now I'll tell you what, there's so many layers of this thing, I can't get them all. But the oyster gets what's called an irritant. Need to write down some words. Uh, need to write down nacre, and we need to write down irritant. I'm going to do this. Can I get a couple of you boys to move this here? But here's some words I want you to get. Right here. Irritant. Can't see that. Don't think about that. About like me. Anyway, the nectar is what comes out of the marrow of the mother pearl. Okay, it's a substance and a solution. But that oyster's laying down there. Watch this. Where's the oysters at? Did they grow up? They're laying down in the muck. They're down in the mire. They're like you and I in this old stinking nasty world. Hey, can I tell you what? An oyster is a bottom feeder. Hey man, I was a bottom feeder, Brother Michael. How I was lost without God and Brother Dean. Me and you was bottom feeders, amen. We was feeding on the lust of the flesh and the lust of the world and the pride of life. And I'll tell you that oyster's down there in the sea, in which is a type of the world. He's down in the muck. But I'll tell you, God comes to the muck, amen. And God saves sinners like me and God saves sinners like you. And he'll come down the muck where you're at. You say, well, I'm not in the muck. You self-righteous hypocrite. You're in the muck with anybody else, amen. If you're self-righteous, it's worse muck than a drunkard. I'd rather deal with a drunkard than a self-righteous religious person in the week, amen. But I'm talking about he gets a, he, that, he, that oyster gets an irritant in him. That's what they call it. An irritant. Now they used to think, and it still may be in some cases, that a little grain of sand would get inside the oyster. And it would irritate the oyster and cause problems and that pearl they start on that. And they said sometimes might be a little bit of dirt get in there. And that would start that nacre film coming over there. But they've discovered in recent years that in most cases that is not the case. In fact, maybe in all cases, the pearl is not started by a grain of sand or a piece of dirt even. It's started by a little feller by the name of the drill worm. Pay attention here. There's a little parasite you can't hardly see with your eye that'll crawl up in the lip of that oyster, crawl himself down in there, and he's a drill worm. I call him the devil worm. And the drill worm has a tail that he can set down like a back hose arms so he can pressure. And then he's also got an acid in his belly that he pukes up that softens the hard layer of mother of pearl. And then he's got a beak on him and it's like a, that's where they get the drill. They literally have taken this terminology to drill oil wells with. You type in drill worm and you'll get talking about, they'll talk about getting oil. And that drill, that drill worm, he, got his, he gets his backside plotted down so he can pressure on the front. Spits out that junk acid. Starts dissolving that. because It's so poison, so powerful, it'll start dissolving that mother pearl there that layer and then he starts drilling and when he's drilling going down to get a hole down there and what's he going to do he's going to eat on it and he's going to kill it listen to me in Genesis chapter 3 the devil drill worm that serpent came to Eve planted his feet down 
and propped his puke in her. Read Genesis 3. If he didn't puke on her, I'll eat your dirty socks. He puked on her with a lie out of hell. And once she let that puke come on her, she start, then he started drilling. Yeah, Amen. Amen. Yeah. He started drilling down. So what's going to happen? If that something doesn't intervene with that, with that, with that oyster, that oyster is doomed to death. Did you know something? That if God doesn't intervene with you and I, that devil drill worm that you, everybody in this building, everybody listen to me, he's been attacked by the drill worm. Everybody in here's got a sin nature in you. You've been hit by the drill worm and he probed through you and he means to destroy. He cometh for not to steal, to kill and destroy, the Bible says. You got a drill worm called sin, a drill worm called the devil, and he is not playing games with you. And buddy, he'll hook down, he'll puke on you and start drilling right through you. And the next thing you know, he'll kill you if you don't have somebody to intervene. Something's got to intervene. Well, thank God in Genesis 3.15, God made a prophecy about the seed of the woman that it would crush the head of the serpent. And God has so fixed that oyster that he has a remedy for the drill worm. Woo! I'm glad God's got a remedy for the, old, the drill worm that hit old Reg Kelly. And Reg Kelly was about 20 some years old and the drill worm had spit on me and tightened into me and he was a drilling on me. And I was dying and going to hell. But one day, something came. Boy, I'll tell you something. Bless my heart. There's a substance called NACRE. N-A-C-R-E. Don't you ever forget that word the rest of your life. NACRE comes and it covers the drill worm. Little bitty old thin super. Can't even see the cover. And you know what he does? Ah, I got to quit. I got to change. I'm getting way ahead of my message. Boy, I'm telling you what, I don't pray for me. Now I want to say this to you. That I, the, the sufferings that you, I want to put this on a little layer here. You're going to have irritants come in your life. Besides the sin nature. So I want to preach on two levels. Salvation level. And the servant level, in other words, serving God level. You say, Reggie, what happened? Well, sin came in, suffering comes because of it. Can I tell you, all the suffering you've ever suffered came because of sin. But it's not our sinful suffering that saves us. It's the suffering of our Lord Jesus Christ that saves us. The Bible said in 1 Peter 3, 18, For Christ also hath once suffered for sin. The just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but quickened by the Spirit. Isaiah said, he was wounded for our transgressions and bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him and with his stripes were healed. The Bible teaches us, I want to say something. Any church that neglects the sufferings of Jesus Christ for their sins is a church that will die. It will die. Because it's through the constant reminding. And that's why we have communion. That's why we preach the cross. That's why we preach the sufferings of the cross. Because when the church loses sight of the fact that Christ suffered for their sins. The Bible said, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross and despised in the shame. Can I remind you that in Matthew chapter 27, our Lord Jesus Christ was brought before a whole band of soldiers. A whole band. Can I remind you they stripped him naked? Can I remind you they blindfolded him? Can I remind you they buffeted him? That means they hit him with their fist. Now I'm going to tell you something. If I'm standing up here and I can see you coming with your fist, I got a, ch I got a chance to move my head back, which will soften the blow tremendously. But if I'm blindfolded and you hit me, I have no idea that fist is coming. Brother, let me tell you something. You can do a lot of damage fast. And the Bible said they buffeted him so much so that Isaiah said that his visions, his facial area was marred more than any man. You could not tell that he had a face by the time they got done with him. He suffered. Then they put a crown of thorns upon him. Crush your crown of thorns. Buddy, I'll tell you, you try one thorn 
Go out there and get, get a thorn tree out here in the Ozarks. Just try one, poke it in your temple. You talk about tender and painful. Can you imagine the precious Son of God for hours and hours and hours, thorns pressed upon his brow, thorns pressed upon his head. God help us to never forget the sufferings of our Savior. God help us. I'll tell you what, we're in our churches today and just, it just ticks me off. There are churches today and we're talking about all about us, how good I'm, all about how it can be better for us. I want to tell you something. I'm telling you why churches are messed up. I'm telling you why Christianity is messed up. It's because we have forgotten the sufferings of our Savior and it means nothing to us anymore and we've, de we've, we've designed a Christianity that's supposed to help us have our better life. The Bible says this, that if we suffer with him, we shall reign with him. If we suffer with him, nobody wants any suffering anymore. I remind you, they mocked him. They spit on him. Brother Bill, if I walk up to you, <laughs> spit in your face. Any decent man in this building would jump up here and say, Reggie, you ain't doing that to him. Yeah. Yeah. Ain't anything more nasty you can do is spit on somebody. Right. It's a picture of the filth and the sinfulness and the vileness of mankind. And our picture of Jesus taking our sin and our filth and our vileness. And I want you to imagine the lovely son of God who never sinned. Thought, deed, word, or action. Band of soldiers walking by him. And the spit drooling and dripping off of his lovely face. God help us to remember we wouldn't be sitting here singing Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound, had it not been for a Savior that was willing to suffer for our sins. Oh God, help Reg Kelly never forget that the reason I'm preaching this morning is because he suffered for my sin. The Bible said they scourged him. They ripped his back. Muscle down to the bones, pulled his flesh. The cat and I just pulled his body, scourged him. The Bible said they smote him with the reed. The Bible says they drove nails into his hands and his feet. Can you imagine? The Bible said he was forsaken by his father. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Can I tell you this morning? This is why in your Bible it said that he sold it all for a pearl of one pearl of great price to church. Hang on to your seats this morning. We better get back to appreciating the church. That Jesus died for the church. We got about a 15 million people out here claim to be saved. They can take it or leave it. They got an attitude toward the church. They dropped his cross in the ground. And for six hours, Jesus Christ hung there in agony. He cried out thirst. And even when they tried to give him painkiller with the myrrh and the vinegar, he refused it. Why? Because he was suffering the fullness of the will of the Father against our sin. He bore our sins, the Bible said, in his own body on the tree. Now I want to tell you something right now. As far as I'm concerned, I want, I'm asking God to keep the sufferings of Christ in the forefront of our minds. Because if we forget that, we'll forget what we're here about. And why we're here. Let me just tell you something. The Bible church, a true Christian church, a true preaching of the church will suffer. Now I'll tell you, I heard something this week that made me do a lot of thinking. I heard a preacher who's well known in this country. I mean, he, I don't follow him, but a lot of people do. And this thing popped up and he said this statement. That there's never been a greater evangelist since the Apostle Paul than Billy Graham. Now I want to tell you something. I do not negate Billy Graham. I'm thankful for whatever and however God used him. I have some questions about some things because when I see the fruit of his evangelism, it is nothing like the Apostle Paul's. And let me say something further to you. Billy Graham never preached nothing to get his hide in jail. He never... Billy Graham never did, was arrested and threatened to be killed by people. And he wasn't beaten thrice with rods. Don't compare Billy Graham to Apostle Paul to me. That won't work. Amen. He didn't even start to scratch the surface. You know why the Apostle Paul was able to, start to spread Christianity throughout the entire continent of Europe? 
is because he was willing to suffer for the cause of Christ. And let me tell you something. God is probably going to bring the church in this last generation back to suffering for the cause of Christ. People believe in something you're willing to die for. They're not interested in what you're willing to live for. They're interested in what you're willing to die for. Most churches do not want to bear any reproach in their communities. That's why most churches won't preach against the godless hell holes of public schools. They do not want to bear the reproach of everybody that's sucked up in it. Are you listening to me? They won't preach on politics and Democrats and sold out Republicans. They won't preach on the Masonic Lodge. And they won't preach on false Bibles. And everybody's just supposed to get along. Why? Because they do not want to suffer the reproach of men. They want to be liked by everybody. Everybody fit in good. That's our problem. We don't want to associate with the sufferings of Christ. Can I tell you something? That when eternity comes, a millennial reign comes, and eternity, that all the public schools are going to be dumped in hell, and the church of our Lord Jesus Christ will still be assailing on. Amen. 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 When the Masonic Lodge has been poured into hell, the church is still going to be sailing on. What I'm preaching out this morning. We like the pearls, but we don't like the suffering to get the pearl. Amen. Everybody wants to be liked. I can preach on all that stuff for a long time. I ain't going to. But I want to tell you this about our relationship to Jesus Christ. We are in him, the Bible says. We are one with him, the Bible says. We're complete in him, the Bible says. He is the bridegroom. He's the head of the church. He is the bridegroom and we're the bride. And we are joined together in that mysterious union Ephesians chapter 5 talks about. But I want to tell you something. That irritant causes suffering. And the old devil has caused suffering every, all across this church this morning. Every family, every life, across the world. Everything you see is that drill worm causing sufferings. But God has something to take care of the sufferings, and that's this right here, Necro. You know what that Necro does? He goes over there, that, that Necro comes out of there, and I'm just going to tell you flat out what it is. The Necro is a picture of the Holy Ghost utilizing the blood of Christ and the grace of God to not only encapsulate and kill the sin, but to cover it and to coat it. Amen. It's a picture of the grace of God being activated through the blood of Christ and the spirit of God in covering and killing, not just killing our sin. By the way, when Jesus saved me, he killed the effect of sin in my life. I'm not dying. I'm going to live forever. He encapsulates that drill worm and in encapsulating it, he shuts off its source of oxygen and he kills it. And then he covers it. What does God do with you and you? He covers us with the righteousness of our Lord Jesus Christ. He coats us with his grace. Now I want to tell you a little something about these pearls. A pearl, to make a pearl of any size, takes thousands of coats. You know what your Bible says? It talks about the manifold grace of God. You know what that means? It folded over you many a time. Did you know the Bible said where sin did abound? Grace did much more abound. The Bible said that he giveth what? More grace. I want to tell you something. I was studying this this morning, this week. And Brother Jason, don't tell anybody, but I had myself an old time Holy Ghost shout and spell. I said, Brother Bill, that's the reason I'm still preaching. It's because I've had manifold grace. Amen. The reason I'm still going to church is because I tell you what, God just kept putting another layer of grace over me, Brother Brett. And I got mad. I had got irritated this week and he covered it again. I got irritated again and he covered it again. Amen. How many of you have had an irritant? <laughs> Say, Reggie, you're my irritant. <laughs> Preachers can irritate you. By the way, let me just throw this in. This is why I said I got 16 rabbit trails. Did you know 
That when a lawyer gets you opposing on the witness stand, he's an opposing lawyer to you. Do you know what that's called in legal terms? He's going to drill down on you. He's going to ask you questions and questions and questions. You know what he's trying to do? Drill down to the truth. Did you know the Holy Ghost is God's? God's advocate and attorney. And he's going to bring, the Bible said part of the reasons the Holy Ghost's work is to convict. And you know what happened to you? You get in church house and the preacher gets to preaching on sin. The Holy Ghost starts to drill it. Amen. You know what happened to me? God, the Holy Ghost drilled down and God got to the truth. I was a lost, self-righteous, religious sinner. I needed to be born again. And God, when you come to church, you know what the Holy Ghost is doing? He's drilling down on you. Amen. I, we, we preach all kinds of stuff on this. Amen. Uh, I'm saying this to you. I'm glad God's got grace that he covers us with over and over and over again. It's a picture of the grace and the blood of God being applied through the power of the Holy Spirit of God. And that old mother of pearl just seeps it out. Now we're talking about the suffering of the pearl. What we're talking about the shaping. And I've kind of already hit some of that. But that old oyster, when the oyster suffers from that irritant, it begins to secrete that substance called nacre. And it begins to coat it and cover it and uh, take care of it. As I said, it'll coat it thousands of times. So you know what? You can't see it no more. I don't know what death in pearls, but you pull them pearls out and you can't see that. That old drill worm used to be in there. You know what's sweet about this bread? Is that God takes my drill worm line. He took it out. I mean, muck would come down in the muck, an old stinking drill worm, and wicked sinner like me, and God covered it. He didn't just cover it, he covered it thousands of times. Thousands of times. And then guess what? When the end comes, it's going to be a pretty pearl. <laughs> Amen. Look at that pearl. Now I got one. Hey, can you put the last two pictures on? I'm going to show you this. Now I'm going to tell you a little story. I've been working on this all week long. And I go down to my mama's this morning. And Hannah's down there with mama. And, and something come up about what I was preaching. I said, well, I'm, for first time in my life, I'm going to preach on pearls. She said, well, I want to show you something. She said, me and some of the other girls were down at Silver Dollar City recently. And she said they had a, a deal down there where you could pick out, some of you know, I didn't know this. You could pick out your oyster. And then they take the, and they got it up. Yeah, now you watch, this will blow your mind. This blow your, she showed these, these two pictures, she sent it to me. I said, send them to me on your deal. And I give them to him and he put them up here. She said, this is when I picked my clam out. And then she said I had them to open it up. Now I want to, isn't that the prettiest thing you nearly ever seen? That's slimy looking. If you eat that, you've got a bad appetite. That nasty looking. Oh, I'm going to take something. Woo! God looked down at me, brother. Hey, see that sorry looking, nasty looking thing. He said, I'm going to coat him with my grace until he looks like that. I'm going to make something different out of him. He opened up the clamshell of my life. And he's been working on me. And it ain't pretty. Now listen to me. You know that song? He's still working on me. That's why God's a doing. Amen. He's still covering me with his grace. Day after day after day after day after day. And then one day, Brother Bill, he's going to open the clamshell up. And they're going to go, ooh. <laughs> that's ugly. That ain't very pretty. But now show them the next picture. Now this is Hannah's pearl that she got. There it is. That's what was inside that nasty looking covering. Oh my, there's so much to learn from here. Now I want to I move over to as a saved person. How many besides me got irritated in the last three years? <laughs> How many's got the message already? You already know what the message is. When an irritant comes into your life, what's the answer? Grace. More grace. <laughs> and uh, so I'm going to tell you this little story. But boy, I, I couldn't believe it. Hannah said, hey, look at these pictures, Dad. I just got me a pearl. I said, you got to be kidding me. First time 41 years I preach on pearl and you're down there getting these pictures. And you don't know what I'm preaching on. Because I'm telling you, when I seen that first picture, I go, that's me, that's me, that's me. But I was a pearl inside of me. Amen. Amen. Y'all, say, Reggie, you're sorry looking dude. I know, I know. You got a lot of slime on you. I know, I know. But I tell you, God's making a pearl. Amen. Right. Now, what was I going to preach on? <laughs> I don't even forget. I, I can't even remember that now. Isn't that pitiful? 
Huh? Saved person. A sa yeah, a saved person. This week, I have a really fancy, fancy business out at my farm. It's called the Rinky Dink Balenoir and Duct Tape Sawmill. <laughs> and, and, and this week, everything broke. I got on the tractor. Steering deal went bad. Can't drive the tractor. I got on the JCB, and it's got this stupid deal where both tires turn, your back tires turn. You, you ever seen them? It wanted to go like this. You ever had one do that, Kenny? You know what I'm talking about. You're trying to get over here where there's some lumber at, and it's going to... I'm getting hot. Got ready to do my meal. My, my, my lubricant deal wouldn't work. The water wouldn't come out on the blade. I look and it was three hours piddling with that thing. Then we go to resaw, putting resaw through. Electrical shuts down. Boop, you're not resaw. I ain't letting you. I jumped up. I said, I think the devil's in the middle of this sawmill. I've had it. Call an auctioneer. I asked Nathan, do you want to do a sale? He said, no. I, Brother Jim, I was irritated. My taters was irritated. I go in the house and I start studying. A pearl, an oyster has irritants. I know all about them. Yeah, God, I got that much. But a pearl takes care of its irritants. Yes, it does. It gets more grace. It gets more grace. Well, Lord, I'm mad. I'm not interested in grace right now. I want things fixed. I want it done. I want it done. All I want to do is work. Is there anything wrong with working? Am I the only one who laughs like this? No. No. <laughs> you're lying. I know you're lying. I mean, this blessed me so much. So you know what I did? Finally, the Lord said, you know what the Lord said? He gives grace to the lowly. Yeah. He said, you're too high and mighty and you think everything's supposed to bark with you. Oh, you think if it don't work when you want it to work, how it's supposed to work, that I'm supposed to jump. I don't jump for you, Reggie. In fact, Reggie, you need a bunch of layers of grace on you. That's your problem because you've got an irritant eating on you and you're not fit to be around. And the real problem with you spiritually is, Reggie, is that you just constantly let irritants irritate you. Yes. You let people at church irritate. Has anybody been irritated by church? No. You're the only one. I'm the only one who gets irritated by it. Reggie, you get irritated working. You get irritated to caring. You get irritated. You get irritated. You get irritated. You get irritated. This is wild. Brett, I literally, the guy I work with, he and I have been talking about this. He's the guy that said he hoped God answers my prayer because you need it. Yeah. I would literally was using the very word. I'm irritated. I'm irritated. I'm irritated. And then here comes God with his message on the pearl. So I'll tell you, if y'all didn't get anything out of it, I got lots out of it. You know what I did? I just found me a place. I got on my knees and I said, God, it's the truth. Yeah. Praise God. I'm, I'm so irritated. I don't know how to fix it myself. And God, I can't. And he said, Reggie, I want to tell you, I send irritants your way <laughs> so you can grow. Yes. Come on. Come on. Amen. So you can be broken. And I'll just, I'll probably, I'll probably go out tomorrow and blow it, okay? I'll just be honest, that's, that's my pattern. But it sure feels good today to at least know what the problem is. Amen. And it sure feels good to know what the answer is. It's not that I didn't know it, but I needed to see it. And I saw it how? Through the beast and the fishes and the animals. Amen. And God used that pearl to show me myself. Yes. And I'll tell you what, Brother Phil, I ain't joking you a bit in the world. I got to looking at the manifold grace of God. 
Then I said to myself, that's all of my life's been is just one layer of grace after another layer of grace. Yeah. And there's been yeah. days I said, I am so done. Has anybody ever said that besides me? I am so done. Uh-huh. I told my wife, I am just so done. Mm-hmm. And I look, I look at Montana and all the Californians are moving there. I don't want to go there. Right. This is the best place I know to be. <laughs> and God gets you where you ain't no place to go. But I tell you, Brother Terry, I saw myself right there. I can't see the shining of the pearl yet, but it's in there. And it's being covered. And I want to encourage you people here today. I don't know whether you've got anything out of this message or not. But if you're getting irritated, say, Lord, lay another layer of grace over me. By the way, he does and you don't even know it. I, oh my land, it's, it's 12.02 I'm on page 7 of 36 <laughs> I'm lying to you, I'm lying to you Well, I think you pretty well got the message, haven't you? Write this down somewhere God turns your problems into a pearl God will turn your problems into a pearl And he'll cover it with his grace <clears throat> the last thing I'll let you out that the sufferings of the pearl that the shaping of the pearl by the way I, I am going to preach this a little bit most pearls turn out pretty round pretty nice but every once in a while they, the pearl just don't turn out very round at all that's me <laughs> but brother <laughs> but brother Josh he still covers it Yeah. he takes it old rough And the time I got through looking at it all and studying all that, I thought, you know what? I think them rough ones are more precious than round ones. I, mean, <clears throat> I last thing is the shining of the pearl. The moon has no light of its own. It's a picture of the church. The moon can only reflect the light of the sun. The pearl has no light of its own. But there are pearls and it's called, they use the word, they don't use the word shine, they use the word luster. That's what they use. And they value pearls, watch this, by their luster. And luster in a pearl is this. It's the condition of that pearl in such a way that it the light that's reflected seems to be coming from inside the pearl out. You see, it's only his light. Amen. Yeah. Amen. I, and I, I'll be honest with you, I, I, I think that needs to be studied out. But uh, I'm trying to wind this thing up. Um... My goodness sakes, did I not mess this whole thing up? There's a whole other message. I'm going to say this to you and I'll quit. As I was studying this, I said a little bit on the start. And I don't know whether I'll preach on this, but I'm going to say it before we go. I found out that there's pearl farms. I found out that in the 1800s, a Japanese man figured out how to produce pearls en masse. And it's called cultural pearls. Most of that's what you know and what you see are cultural pearls. Do you know honestly they're not real? They're not natural. They're not God. They're, they've been messed. What's the doing? They've been messed with by man. Did you remember me saying that only one out of 10,000 pearls in the natural make a pearl? I'll throw this at you. I've got to study in the book of Revelation. The false church has pearls. The cultural pearls are a picture of man devised fake Christianity. 
I, don't, I, ain't, I ain't gonna lie to you. I studied this thing this week, Brother Dean. And my mind couldn't, I couldn't, I couldn't grab all of it. The message of the pearl. But you know something? I'm gonna let the Lord and all the uh, take care of all that stuff. Today, Brother Don's in. I'm just gonna rejoice. That he give me another layer of grace. Amen. And he's going to give us grace till we take our last breath. Amen. Because his grace, not our goodness, but his grace is sufficient. Amen. And my message to you, beloved people, today is this. When the devil tries to drill on you, <laughs> you just say, Lord, give me another layer of grace. Amen. Seal him off. Cover it that up and make me make this whole situation that I'm in that's painful, that's irritable. Does this not fit Romans 8 28? That all things work together for good to them that love the Lord. And you know what I want for you? And by the way, your name's Richard. I gotta tease you, I like that couple. They're sweet as they can be. And I, I, how far do you all drive? Oh, okay. Well, you don't have to. You could walk there. You know. <laughs> but, uh, Brother Richard, I'll tell you. I, I'm now thankful that my tractor tore up. I'm now thankful that my JCB was walking sideways. Now I'm thankful that my sawmill wasn't working. Amen. Yeah. And in the middle of all this junk yeah. this week, God says, now, Reggie, move out of the physical realm. And I want you to look at your spiritual problems. Then I want you to start thanking me. And Reggie, there's going to be a pearl come out of this situation. Just give me time. Pearls are not made overnight. Good time. Pianist comes. Here's what I want you to do. If you're here today... You say, Reggie, I'll tell you what, I got some irritable things been bothering me and I just need more grace. Ain't nobody's business but me and God. And you want to come and just say, Lord, you want to do what your pastor did this week and just say, Lord, I, I need a little grace. I need another layer. <clears throat> Why don't you come? Let's stand together. If you're lost today without God and the old devil drill worms drilled in your soul and you need a savior, you come. I didn't get this message all preached and probably best that I didn't. But you come. There's an irritant. There's things I don't understand. Things causing me discomfort and grief. And I tell you, <clears throat> this message probably meant more to me than anything I preached in a long time because I'm in worse shape spiritually right now than I was five years ago. Because the things irritate me. And I just like God, if I don't get some grace, I don't know what I'm going to do. But I tell you, He's got the grace. Amen. What I need to do is humble myself and He'll cover it. He'll give another layer. You may have come to church this morning. You said, God, if you don't do something for me today, this is probably the last time I'm coming. If I was you, I'd step out of that seat and say, God, if you'll give me another bucket of grace, layer of grace. I'll be back next Sunday. You may be here today and thinking you're going to leave your spouse. The answer is grace. The answer is grace. Did you notice this morning the songs that were sung in this church? They did not know what I was preaching. They did not know that Pearls was about grace. They sung wonderful grace of Jesus. You need some grace this morning. The devil's been irritating you. If you're here and you're not saved today, I encourage you with all my heart. Let me tell you something, that old drill worm gonna kill you. If you don't get the grace of God, of our Lord Jesus Christ, he'll kill you, he'll drill right through you. Take the life right out of you. We're getting ready to head down to the baptistry at the tabernacle here in just a few minutes. But I tell you what, I wanna encourage you. You say, Reggie, I didn't need this message this week, or maybe you will a year from now, and hope you'll remember it. Brother Dodge, 
Would you care to come here just a second, please? Could I really aggravate you? Could I irritate you, please? <laughs> These folks were headed home from church. And um, car come across in front of them up here on the highway 60 and terrible wreck and wife I mean really really hurt she's doing good and good and wonderful but I'd would you care just to give a couple three minutes of testimony about God's grace in the midst of this and there's a reason I ask it for I've been watching this guy <clears throat> during this and unless you're a good cover you look to me like you sure have been getting grace yes would you just give it to word testimony to these people about that? I know I may aggravate you, but that's what I do is irritate people. <laughs> well, uh, not sure what to say, but God's grace is sufficient. Um, he gives it when it's needed. Amen. Um, and uh, we needed it. He supplied it. <laughs> Can't say much more than that. He's a man of few words, I can tell you that. <clears throat> yes. He'll let you do all the talking. But he's a, me and him, the reason, he and I oftentimes have prayer together up here after singing. And I tell you what, I've learned to love him, appreciate him in the Lord, his son, his family. And they're, they're just trying to serve God and raise their family Amen. for the Lord. And they're a blessing. And uh, I watched him go through this tragedy and go through this trial. And, uh, you know, his wife, well, me tell you, it was rough, wasn't it? I mean, she, she's in bad shape. But God has given them grace, and I watched God give them grace. And one of the reasons I wanted him to come today is because when tragedy hits your family, when troubles hit your family, you know, they weren't planning on being to the hospital. They weren't planning on all that happening. But God will give grace. And I just watched God give grace. And I've watched a lot of you people, God, give grace to you in your tragedies and your trials and your troubles. And I just want to encourage you. His grace will be sufficient. Amen. And always remember the pearl that it was started with a drill worm but God made a pearl out of it Amen. and with thousands thousands of layers of grace anyway would you dismiss us and we're going to head down to the baptistry and I hope you'll come we've had I think at least maybe three or four people being baptized maybe more but I hope you'll come be with them sister Angela and her daughter Peyton are going to get baptized today and I'm so glad for them and uh, I just appreciate what God's doing brother would you dismiss us please Lord God, we thank you that you understand our trials, that you supply grace to us. Lord, thank you for, the, for this church, for the support that you've given us. Lord, help us to be a blessing and an encouragement to those around us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. We'll see you down at the tabernacle.